The official funeral uh, for Zimbabwe's uh, former President uh, Robert Mugabe is expected to get underway right about now. We were live in Rufaro Stadium a short while ago in Harare with my colleague Vuyo Mvogo. So dignitaries have begun to arrive. Now we'll be keeping an eye on those proceedings and take you live there as soon as the official program starts. But for now, I'm joined in the studio to talk about Mugabe's legacy by political analyst Professor David Moore and the founder of organizing for Zimbabwe. We trust Terence Sachitapi. I think both of you got a link with the University of Johannesburg. True. Uh, am I True. correct? Oh, okay, good. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you, Terence and Prof. Thank you. Good to see you again. Just as a, as, as a parting short, I was just looking at the program. You guys haven't seen it. And I'm looking at the kind of, of, of people who've been set to speak. There's a lot of history here. The, uh, you've got the former president of Ghana, J.J. Uh, Rawlings, former president of Namibia, Dr. Sam Nyama, besides people like President Ramaphosa who will speak on behalf of, according to the program of South Africa and the AU. Well, what does such a, a, a program say in, in your mind? Let's start with you, Terence, about Robert Mugabe. Okay, thank you. So I think it's clear that um, despite what we have seen um, in the past um, we also saw in Zimbabwe the apparent division in terms of uh, what legacy Robert Mugabe is. It's quite apparent that uh, from the Africa side of things, um, the, the leaders of Africa, the people of Africa, do see Robert Mugabe as a real hero. It might be a different question when you look to Zimbabweans themselves, but the fact of the matter is we can't take away that part of Mugabe which he managed to do during his, uh, his, his, his lifetime. I was looking, Prof, at the words that were used when the news broke that Mugabe had passed away. I mean, global headlines. You had words like uh, liberation hero. Mm -hmm. You had words like the first president of independent Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. You had words like dictator. You had words like despot and some words like tyrant. So you have a mixed bag of the words that were used to describe him. But when you look at the program, you can see that Africa has taken a moment to pause to say, Let's honor him for a certain part, look at the whole picture rather than only a part of it. Well, I think especially if we look at the moment of 1980. So Zimbabwe was emerging from a, a racist minority regime. South Africa was in the midst of that struggle. I mean, it really heated up in 85, 86, right? State of emergency, Cold War, Mozambique, Angola. And so Mugabe and ZANU-PF and, and, and ZAPU, Joshua and Como, the whole liberation struggle, I think, became kind of, you know, when leaders become leaders, the focus becomes on, on them. And you want to think the best. So, and also, Zimbabwe's tra strategic position in Southern Africa was really, really important. Because South Africa and Namibia, Namibia and South Africa, in that order, were going to be next. And you had Mozambique, Angola, connected in the minds especially of people in the West with communism, the USSR. And those countries had formed what was known as a frontline state. Exactly. Including yeah. Zambia with the likes of Kenneth Kaunda and uh, Julius Nyerere in, in Tanzania. Yeah. And that moment, even though it was 20 years, 25 years after, you know, Ghana, uh, Tanzania, was still part of that moment of the liberation of Africa as a whole. And I don't think the leaders want to forget that. They want to remember that as a glorious moment and they want to keep it that way. But the younger generation like Terence, who grew up in a free Zimbabwe, will be remembering different stuff under, under, under Mugabe. We can't really wipe that away now or off the, the, the face of the earth, can we, Terence? So we can't, and uh, which is probably what forms the basis of the polarization we see in how people are viewing the legacy of um, former President Mugabe. You have a younger generation, like you are saying, who grew up, you know, in pretty much a Zimbabwe that uh, struggles with electricity, you know, in towns that have been struggling with basic social services. On the, hand, on the other hand, you have an older generation that saw, you know, the goodness of independence, at least for the greater part of that. So you, you actually find that the very genesis of this polarization has a lot to do with other things outside the person of President Mugabe as much as it has its genesis in the person of President the, Mugabe. This past week we've seen Zimbabweans honoring the man. Yesterday live on ENCA for the second day we saw them filing past uh, his coffin at Rufaro Stadium in Harare and young and old and ENC speaking to them all having different views but they were saying this is a moment uh, uh, that we must just say may his soul rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we, 
definitely can't run away. You actually find that um, in our, you know, African culture, African tradition, it's what is always done. You know, we mourn the dead. I think uh, there is that um, uh, that line of saying, um, you know, he who has died is now, you know, pe perfect. You know, how do you say it in Shona? Somebody um, said to me in Shona the other day, and yes, I forgot. Well, it's it's wafawanaka. You know, wafawanaka. Yes, to say he was dead. Because wafawanaka means that everything is good. <laughs> yes, so wafawanaka yes, means he was dead. dead you're is good. Perfect in that, perfect in that in that state. But of course, we can't. Ra yeah, yeah, carry on. Yes, but of course we can't run away from the fact that he did preside over the material deterioration. I mean, of, uh, after all, as a leader, he became a president of a country. And as you said, he, there was hope at the time in 1980. And people were hoping that Zimbabwe, I remember President Samora Machel. I was a young journalist at the time mm. working for Radio Mozambique's English service when he flew from Maputo on his way to the then Salisbury mm. before it was Harare for the first time. And there was hope in the region. Samora Machel spoke about Zimbabwe is going to become the driver of economic growth. It's going to become the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Well, um, this is often the case, and many people who criticize Mugabe say he started to go wrong very early, actually, in 1980, when he started to take up the cudgels against Zapu. Uh, a few days, a few weeks, uh, on May 9th, to be precise, he was in London speaking with Maggie Thatcher complaining already about Zapu killing people. He says, we're going to have to do something about this. They are going to create chaos. They want to force us to call another election. And you can almost see in your mind's eye Maggie Thatcher saying, hey, wow, this is a way of keeping the ANC out of Zimbabwe, right? Because the ANC in the minds of people like Margaret Thatcher in those days was controlled by the Soviet Union. And they had a closer alliance with Zapu? The ANC than yes. ZANU yes. at the time. Yes, and ZANU was closer to PAC because they came because when ZANU split off from ZAPU, and here we go again to the beginning of faction fighting in Zimbabwean politics, and Mugabe was the perfect master of that until he got too old, and until the fly in the ointment came up with Grace Mugabe and and, and the Generation Forty. Um, so, even so my point of departure is actually in seventy six seventy seven during the liberation struggle. So a lot of the people who come and say, no, after 1980, he went bad. Well, I look back to my kind of special interest in the history of the liberation war was in the 1970s. When, and again, we get to generational issues. A younger, okay, so we had um, detente at the end of 74, right? When Kenneth Kowunda and Forster were trying to create a situation so that the red- We shall forget that meeting on the train on the Victoria Force. Exactly trying to get moderate leaders into power so that the Soviets wouldn't take over Zimbabwe through Zapu, right? Robert Mugabe and many other leaders, Joshua Nkomo, Nana Beninga Satoli, who had been in prison for almost 10 years, were released to go to Salisbury and talk with the leaders of the frontline states, the newest of which were Samora Michel and Agostino Neto. In Angola, yeah. Be, because the Portuguese had a coup, the soldiers got angry about having to fight this stupid colonial war. Portugal had a coup, they said, okay, Angola, go your own way, Mozambique, go your way, um, East Timor, go your own way, et cetera, et cetera. So Kawunda and Henry Kissinger and, 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 and Kawunda's friends, UNITA, the non-communist mm. liberation party. John Savimbi's lot, yeah. Uh, said, well, if Zimbabwe goes red, we're in trouble. We're encircled South Africa. South Africa, of course, is always the key issue in these discussions. Mugabe comes out of prison. Samora Michel meets him with Ken and Samora Michel says, What? You're not not a Beninga Satoli. You're not the leader of Zanu. Was there a coup in prison? Mugabe had replaced Satoli in prison. And there's a long story behind that. And soon after that, well, Mugabe was very, very smart. He knew you'd have to go with the militant soldiers because the war had begun in 72. It was getting very serious. Chitebo, her t Herbert Chitebo, who was the national chairman of ZANU, based in Lusaka, was assassinated on March 1975. In its Volkswagen Beetle, boom. Nobody knows to this day who did it. Some of the Rhodesians claim they did it, but some of those Rhodesians who claim they did it were actually part of the security service in post-1980. So they had a reason for saying they did it. So the whole, it was a mess. And the, and, and the young soldiers, and here we get into the generational issue, young soldiers, very well trained, 
um, radical in the sense of being Marxist, radical in the sense of being very already suspicious of this new petty bourgeois, this new middle class leadership which might take over the war and the leadership because they'd seen what had happened in the rest of Africa, right? So they were seen by Mugabe as a challenge. They started up the war again. Mugabe tries to come into Mozambique to meet them in the camps, but he's stopped by the Mozambicans, by Frelimo. So he and Edgar de Carrick, Actually, Samora uh, uh, put him under so-called house arrest exactly. in, in Zambezia province, it, where he it, taught it, English at a secondary yes. school for some time, in while they, he was trying to understand what was happening exactly. with ZANU and who is this Mugabe guy. Yes, and the young soldiers are trying to understand Mugabe because they had said on their escape from Zambia, because Zanla was kicked out of Zambia by, by KK because they killed Chitepo and they killed a few people before in another little uh, rebellion um, earlier on. So the young soldiers said at Magagawa, as they were traveling to Dar es Salaam to meet Nyeri to, 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 give their, to get their credentials from Nyeri, they stopped in Magagawa argued with the camp leaders for 24 hours, should we accept Robert Mugabe as our leader? They said, yes. And that's the famous Magagawa Declaration, which has put him up there and dumped Satoli, right? But in the meantime, these young radical soldiers are getting to know Mugabe, and yeah, they're not so sure. Long story short, by January 77, Michelle and Mugabe threw all those guys in prison, where they stayed until 1980. So that's my point of departure. How did Mugabe handle these contradictions in the Liberation War? And they're still there now, as we've seen. We'll, 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 we'll continue over. this fascinating discussion. <laughs> I can see Terence there as well, looking there and learning a lot uh, from the professor. And as we, we continue uh, to, to look at the life and uh, legacy of Mugabe.